You left um, these shores in 1967, I think it was. You went over to 66. 66, you packed up your family, young family, and jumped. You didn't jump on a plane. You had to jump on a ship for a couple of months to get over there. No, I went. My dad and I went by plane, and Jan and the kids and my mum went by by boat. And uh, so I had to get over there, and we, I shipped the Perrin Nortons and Jack Bates little 125 Honda. So we had to get over there and buy a, a, a van to put him in, a little caravan. <laughs> caravan, I can't believe it. And uh, get organised, and then uh, my mother and my wife and kids, we picked them up in Italy. And uh, back then it was kind of different. And uh, if you take your wife and your two little kids to Europe in 1966 and go through a whole race season and your wife hasn't left you before the season's over, you know she's a keeper. <laughs> and you did it for more than just one season too? Only five years. I mean, that was, in a way, I went to Europe too late. I mean, I didn't go to Europe until I was 28 years of age. And, uh, I mean, I had a really good career in Europe, but, you know, so far as a motorcycle race career, I wasted, you know, some time in Australia. And... Uh, Back then, you know, the, the first year in Europe is a total write-off because you've got to learn all the big long tracks. I mean, the Isle of Man, 37 miles round, and Belgium and all those places. They're all on the roads and at eight, 10 mile circuits. And heck, by the time you started the race, you weren't even sure, you know, where you are to go, as good as you could go. So the first year is a bit of a, 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 a bit of a loss. And also you're, uh, you're negotiating every week for, start money um, and it wasn't I mean you're on your own if you're any good none of the other riders wanted to help you because you you know they didn't want good riders showing up from, from Australia and then. so you had to learn all that you had to learn how to drive around and there was carnets and customs and all this stuff and so the first year is really difficult the second year I, I made a good move that I got a 350 m Mackie which I ended up pretty much the best of the privateer 350s, and so from, you know, by the third year, you know, I, I sort of knew where I was going, what to do, and things turned around, and then I had, you know, two really good years, and then um, um, Jan was pregnant with my third child, and we just said, you know, it's time I stopped doing this, and uh, we were going to... I'd raced Daytona the, on beginning of 1970 and won the 250 race and, and I had a chance to go back with said, oh, we'll do one race in America on the way home because I had an Australian version Mercedes and everything, you know, I was, I was coming back to Australia and I had a really good year in America and then Yamaha signed me up and that was, uh, heck, the first of 20 years of contracts with Yamaha, I guess, one way or another. So uh, I've been with Yamaha's, you know, for for a really long period till I finally got out of the motorcycle race and thing all together. So. Just going back to your uh, 1969 championship year, what happened that year wouldn't have, you couldn't do it anymore. You're racing for Air Mackey and then all of a sudden Benelli come along and say, can you ride this? Because uh, Paolo um, um, Ms. Pasolini was uh, injured at the Isle of Man and uh, Air Mackey, well, Air Mackey actually gave you their grace to go and um, race for another brand. Uh, 69, I, I, uh, Air Mackey factory gave me a 125 and a 350 and a 380 and a spare engine for each, but no mechanics. You know, I had to look after all myself. I was kind of the blue-eyed boy at Air Mackey at the time. And uh, so um, I get to the Isle of Man and... Uh, they, Pasolini was hurt and they'd signed Phil Reed up to ride the Benelli. And they came to me and said, uh, you know, would you like to ride the second bike? And I got onto the factory, the Mackey factory, and they said, okay. And uh, Phil Reed was supposed to read the bottom, win the race, basically. And uh, anyhow, end of the first lap, yes, you know, you start one at a time or two at a time back then. End of the first lap, I was like 20 seconds in the lead, but my friend Rod Gould was second on the Yamaha and Reedy was third, so I couldn't slow down. So I kept going and then eventually they just put a sign out, uh, first okay, so I won that. And then after that, they 
uh, wanted to sign me that basically helped Pasolini win the championship. And M. Mackey said, oh, OK, you can ride out 350 and ride the Benelli. They were really good to me. But the problem was, it was Tyler Mann was the fourth Grand Prix. So I didn't, at the start of the Isle of Man, I had no points at all, period. And uh, uh, everything kind of went according to plan. And then like halfway through the season, things changed a little bit because it looked like I would probably had more chance to win the championship with Pasolini. So suddenly I kind of got slow bikes and stuff. But then Pasolini fell off and then all of a sudden I had a spare bike and the best engines and with three races to go and it was, I had to like at least have two wins in a second and that's you know it turned out all right so I got lucky. Then uh, they changed the rules for the 250s, they banned the four cylinder and I was going to ride the Pepinelli the next year and then there was a problem come up with contracts and so I got a pair of Yamahas and uh, I got second in the 250 and second in the 350 championship and won the Isle of Man again. And I was a Yamaha man from then on. And you won more races with the Yamaha that year than you did the previous year, but still missed out on the World Championship. Yeah, it's, uh, it, I had problems. Uh, Gould and Anderson had the factory Yamahas and they had uh, electronic ignition and I had the old point ignition. And... Um, God, we called the 250, we called it Herbie. That damn Herbie could read the last lap sign, I think, was three times I was leading in the last lap the points break. I put new points in it for the race. And in the end, I, well, halfway through the season, I got that first probe of ignition, but then it was kind of too late. I won a couple more races, but, but it had slipped away, so. To this, uh, to this day, uh, some of the factory guys is basically, oh, kill sign, very sorry about point system <laughs> or after all those years yeah i mean i should have won 1970 um i should have won it easy to be honest hey my friend rod gill won it and what the hell you're a world champion doesn't matter how many times you did it once if you can do it more than that it's well and good but hey if you do it once get it now, and fast forward to a couple of years where you um managed to get to 1973 after you took over the yamaha team in America, and this young 16-year-old would, would have been about 16 at the time when it came along. Yeah, I guess Kenny was 18. I, uh, I had a really good, I did one year in America, and we were going to go home. Um, to me, like, Australia's still home, but I mean, we were going to come home, and and then uh, Kawasaki wanted to sign me, and then Yamaha said, no, 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 we'll, we'll move what they offer and everything, so... I signed with Yamaha and one of my deals was I would build Kenny Roberts' bikes and teach him road racing because uh, he was their junior rider and uh, that's, I mean, that's how that started and then uh, the next year they said um, uh, we would like you to take over the whole Yamaha road racing thing so I got workshops and I hired mechanics and, uh, the transporter and Yamaha supplied the bikes and the riders and the budget and everything and that's and that's where the the yellow and black Yamaha design come we had we were the first one that had that because we had it on the road race bikes and I wish the hell I'd have been over the pattern the color scheme so is that your idea oh, I worked with Yamahas on it because we even had it we didn't even have a Yamaha name on the bike I mean they wanted to make a, a design that recognized Yamaha and uh, I had a contract with, um, with Yamaha Japan to do development work on the 250, 350 and then the 750 production race bikes because they were more worried about their factory bikes. And so I did mostly development work on that. And then 78, Kenny uh, was kind of still struggling with the dirt track because the, you know, the ammo wasn't good enough and he kind of thought about going to Europe and I think Japan kind of wanted him to go and they wouldn't give him bikes unless I went and I said oh, I'll go for one year and Dan said well I'm not going unless we have a motorhome so that's when the motorhome thing started because Kenny and I were the first ones with motorhomes and uh, my one year contract developed into the next 12 years or something. And you won more championships as an engineer than you did as a rider which must be a pretty uh 
a big um, credit to you as well. Yeah, we got, uh, I think, three year world championships with Kenny and three with Eddie in 10 years or something. I could talk to you all day, and I'm sure everybody could, but we've got every other people to see. But I've got to ask you one question. How does an Australian end up on a uh, postage stamp in the Middle East? I don't know, but at least they spelled my name right. <laughs> they got the flag wrong, but they spelled your name right. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, I mean, it wasn't too big a country, so it wasn't such a big deal. Yeah, it's better than nothing, I guess. But how does that happen? Oh, man, if I know. <laughs> but I didn't make any money out of it, so what the hell? <laughs> All right, put your hands together for Kelp to others. We're going to talk to him again over the next couple of days. I could be talking to him for...